Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another episode in our series on the journey to the afterlife. We started with the moment of death and the journey of the soul after death through the stages of al-barzakh. And we spoke about the day of judgment, yawm al-qiyamah. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you and I on the day of judgment. And we began discussing the topic of the hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the hellfire. And we reach now the topic of the sins that lead people, including Muslims, to the hellfire if they are not careful, if you do not repent for your sins, if they accumulate so much to the point where on the day of resurrection you come and you have so many sins that you go through all the types of mercy and shafa, but there's still too many sins. So these people might get punished for some of these sins. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from falling into the traps of shaitan. Today, inshallah ta'ala, we want to continue talking about these sins that lead to temporary punishment in the hafar. So the first is that we were speaking about the topic of backbiting and how to repent from backbiting. And we just want to add one more note on that, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ladina amanu, in ja'akum fasiqum binaba'in fatabayyanu. And to see who come and be Jahara for to speak who Allah may fall to Nadimin. Oh, you who have believed, if someone comes to you, a disobedient person, or whoever comes with, with news, bad news, something that is not good, verify it. Fata Bayanu. If you do not, it might cause you to lead to harm to other people, it might cause other people harm. Fata Bayanu and to see who come and be Jahara. And then you will become of those who are regretful over what you've done. Why did I pass it on when it was not verified? So many of our problems as an ummah and as communities and even as families and even as a couple if you're married. So many problems can be alleviated and avoided if we only checked and verified things without assuming and without passing on things that we've heard. Go and verify. Always double check. So you double check, you verify it's true. Because if you, do not, if you do not, you could cause a huge problem for your family or for others. So be careful, my dear brothers and sisters, from falling into this trap of shaitan. We want to talk about one of the things that leads to the hellfire. And by Allah, this is one of the worst sins possible. And this is the sin of consuming riba, interest and usury. Dealing with interest and usury. So this is one of the sins that leads to the hellfire without a doubt and the scholars have unanimously agreed upon this since the time of the Prophet Sallallahu to the present day and age. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says about the people who indulge in riba, especially the ones who multiply the riba, Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O you who have believed, لا تَأْكُلُوا الْرِبَى أَضْعَافًا مُضَعَفًا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Do not eat or consume the riba doubled and multiplied. This is even worse. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So that you may prosper, you may succeed. Meaning, so you may be saved. And immediately afterwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّقُوا النَّارِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ And immediately follows up with the ayah about riba and he says, وَاتَّقُوا النَّارُ الَّتِي أُعَدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ And fear the fire, fear the punishment of the hellfire that is prepared for the disbelievers. Allah follows up a verse and a commandment to stay away from riba with a verse about the punishment of the hellfire. So be careful, my dear brothers and sisters. The Prophet ﷺ counted riba or included riba as one of the seven major sins that would doom a person to be committed to the hellfire. And Al Bukhari and Muslim report from Abu Huraira that the Prophet ﷺ said, avoid these seven sins that will condemn the one who commits them to the hellfire. They asked, what are they, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, associating anything in worship besides Allah, shirk. 
The second thing he said is magic and witchcraft. Black magic and witchcraft. The third is killing anyone whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden, except in the case of justice. The fourth is consuming riba. The fifth is consuming the wealth of the orphan. The sixth is running away from the battlefield. And the seventh is slandering the reputation of innocent, chaste, believing women. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa about these seven major things. Imagine in a hadith where it's talking about killing, it's talking about shirk, it's talking about consuming the orphan's wealth. It's talking about all of these terrible things in black magic and witchcraft. Allah is mentioning, or the Prophet وسلم, is mentioning, consuming riba, taking interest. And this is one of the worst things that you can do. Sadly, in our day and age right now, riba is so common that it has, it has become the norm to use. It has become the norm in most societies to run on interest-based banks. And this is very common, and this is very sad. And this is what's leading to problems in the world financial and economical problems. This is what's re leading to the problems between the rich and the very poor. That we have a system that's not based on justice. It's not based on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed is better for mankind. And now although there are Islamic banks all around the world that are on the rise because of their superiority, they are on the rise because of their superiority to both Muslims and non-Muslims. A lot of people, Muslims as well, still deal with, deal with interest-based banking. And this is not permissible, meaning to actually consume the riba, to receive or to pay the riba. So the problem here is that when it comes to interest, and it is very common, the problem is for the one who pays the riba, the one who pays it. You, you pay any interest, you're part of the punishment. You have a punishment. You receive the interest or you witness the interest. So you're one of the two witnesses or you deal with the contract writing. You actually set up this contract so that people can deal with interest. And so nowadays, a lot of Muslims around the world have to be extra cautious with the issue of finances, the issue of uh, interest, and they shouldn't shy away from asking legitimate scholars, legitimate people who understand the situation that they're living in, in their area, about the issues they're going through and what they can do to avoid falling into haram because you want to avoid falling to haram no matter what. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the trap or the sin of riba. Now, I want to mention two things about this point. The first is that there's a man who came to us in the masjid after a lecture about riba. We talked about interest. He came to me and he said, I'm being offered a job at another company. And we mentioned this story before. He said, I'm being offered a job at another company and they're offering me so much more wealth so much greater in salary, almost double. But they want me to create software applications that will do all the interest calculations for them so they can charge people interest. Am I allowed to do this? So he asked a few scholars and he came to our lecture and he asked about this. He said, I'm deciding now, just now after this lecture, that I'm going to leave this because I trust that Allah will give me something better. Whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah Allah will give him something better. Trust in the promise of Allah. Trust in the promise of Allah. He said, by Allah, one week later, he came back to me. One week after this, he was trembling. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most generous, the most merciful. He said, one week later, they came to him with a job offer at his own company. He didn't have to leave his job and go somewhere else. His own company offered to, prom to promote him to a much higher position. And they offered him a job with a salary like the salary of the other place, if not a little more. Imagine he had not been patient and that he had resigned and left to follow the greater amount of salary, the greater wealth, with something that was haram. He would have lost out on halal, rizq. And we mentioned the story of Ali radiallahu anhu. When he went to the masjid, he came back out and there was a man that he told to hold on to his horse. He brought two dirhams to give to the man. Suddenly the man is not there. So Ali radiallahu anhu tells his servant, go to the marketplace, buy us some new saddles for the horse. So the man goes, the servant goes, he buys a new rein, set of reins, he comes back, and they put the reins on the horse, and then he says, I bought these for two dirhams. And this is the same reins that belong to Ali radiallahu anhu. Ali radiallahu anhu said, subhanallah, a servant may prevent himself from lawful sustenance, from halal sustenance, halal rizq, because of impatience. 
So be patient and trust Allah. Be patient and trust that Allah will give you something good if you avoid that which is haram. And if you are doing haram right now, and you feel like your wealth is dependent on it, your job is dependent on it, your family is dependent on it, when you leave it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, trust in the promise of Allah. By Allah, He will replace it with something much better and something that is pure, tayyib, halal. That is why we say, Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'ah. Well, Allah, we ask you for beneficial knowledge, wa rizqan tayyibah, and for wealth and sustenance that is pure. Wa amalan salihan mutaqabbala. And actions that are good and that are accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, the issue of riba is very widespread. It is very common. It is very dangerous. You need to be careful with your wealth. You need to be careful not to contaminate your money. And the one who receives interest without really asking for and not realizing that they gave them this interest can get rid of it in certain ways. And it is not good to use this interest-based money to donate to the masajid. Rather, you should cut off all ties of receiving interest and you should get rid of it in a way where it's not establishing a masjid because that, that wealth for the masjid has to be pure. So this is in regards to the issue of riba. One of the sins that leads people to the hellfire is consuming the wealth of the orphans. Consuming the wealth of the orphans or consuming people's wealth or property unjustly. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ أَمْوَالَ الْيَتَامَ ظُلْمًا إِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُونَ فِي بُطُونِهِمْ نَارًا وَسَيَصْلَوْنَ سَعِيرًا Those who unjustly eat up the property of the orphans, they take the property of the orphans or the wealth of the orphans. Indeed, they eat up a fire into their own bellies, into their own stomachs, and they will soon endure a blazing fire, the fire of hell. The orphans, when they're under someone's care, someone's guidance, someone's protection, the person who is guarding them, their guardian should protect them and should not consume their wealth unjustly or unfairly. And so this is one of the things that leads to punishment in the hellfire. There's also consuming the wealth of the people, not just the orphans. Taking other people's wealth or money or even your own company, your own business. Taking wealth that's unjust and unfair, that you don't own the property to. You don't own the right to take it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O you who have believed, لَا تَأْكُلُوا أَمْوَالَكُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ بِالْبَاطِلِ إِلَّا أَن تَكُونَ تِجَارَةً عَن تَرَاضٍ مِنْكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not consume one another's wealth unjustly, but only in lawful business by mutual consent. Both of them have to agree. And do not kill yourselves. Verily, Allah has been merciful to you. Consuming the wealth of other people, the land of other people, the rights of other people, they are sacred in Islam. Islam came to protect the rights of people and to protect your honor and your dignity and your blood. The rights of the people that you violate will come back to haunt you in the grave and on the day of resurrection. And on that day, the absolute justice will take place. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from falling into this trap. We're going to take a short break, inshallah ta'ala. And when we come back, we will continue talking about the sins that lead to the punishment of the hellfire. Stick around, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Scale of justice will be broke before man. Justice will be broke before man. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back from the break. Before we took a short break, we started talking about the concept or the sin of consuming the wealth of other people, consuming the rights of other people. By Allah, when you take the rights of other people, it will come back to haunt you in this dunya without barakah and in the grave with punishment and on the day of resurrection with returning back your rights to these people. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, do you think on the day of judgment, when you're standing there, that if you had stolen something from someone else, you took their rights, do you think that you're going to give them back what you stole? For example, if you stole someone's vehicle or someone's land, do you think on the day of judgment they want your land or they want that vehicle? Rather, the form of currency on the day of resurrection are only deeds, the hasanat and the sayyat. So, for example, let's say on the day of judgment, you took someone's uh, land and they want to take the right back from you. When you're standing there on the day of resurrection, they're going to request some of your hasanat. That's all you can give them. You won't have land with you. You won't have the property. You won't have any wealth. 
If there was wealth, you people would have tried to use it to save themselves from the fire. But the wealth is useless. So, on that day, you will give up your hasanat. Imagine. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he described the day of resurrection to us, there's a place on the day of resurrection that we're going to talk about in the future when we talk about paradise, inshallah. There's a place before paradise in which the believers who cross over a sirat they reach this bridge, this area, the waiting place. And it was called Qantara. So this place of waiting, the believers now, the ones who are going to enter Jannah, inshallah, the believers now, they're trading with their rights. So now they're making up everything that was wrong. They're clearing up all the wrongs. How? They're giving up hasanat and they're taking siyat. So if somebody, you took their right, on the day of judgment, wants it back, they did not forgive you for it, then on the day of judgment, they will take your hasanat. Imagine losing hasanat. How terrible must that feel? On the day of judgment, it's valuable. That is the goal. That is the currency. So they take your hasanat. What happens if so many people have been wronged by you on the day of resurrection? And we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that. These people will take your hasanat and then you will run out. But then there are still people waiting, asking Allah, Oh Allah, this person took my right. So what will happen? They will throw their sayyat on you. And so you'll have more sayyat. So my dear brothers and sisters, consuming the rights and the property and the wealth of other people is a very dangerous thing. Because Allah wants you to fulfill His rights as the creator and the rights of the creation. And this is perfect harmony. When you're in harmony with the Creator and the creation, you have done well. So let's talk about this beautiful example, this beautiful hadith. Rasulullah tells us, as was reported by Abdullah ibn Umar, that there were three travelers, three men who were traveling. Now these three men, when they were traveling, they ended up stopping inside a cave because there was a storm. So they go inside the cave. While they're inside the cave, a huge rock or avalanche blocks the front of the cave. And they try to leave and they cannot leave. They're stuck in the cave. So one of the three men says, how about we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We make dua to Allah in the name of some virtuous deed, some good thing that we did. Something good that we did, ask Allah through it. So one of the men, he started to make dua and he said, oh Allah, my parents were very old and I used to give them milk every night. And one day I went out far away by the time I came back, my parents were asleep. So I stood by their bedside. I didn't want to disturb their sleep because these are my parents. I didn't want to disturb their sleep. So I waited by their bedside holding the milk. And my children were crying out of hunger. And my wife, they wanted food. They wanted drink. But I wanted to wait until I fed my parents first. And then finally, I stood by their bed until finally they woke up before the flush of dawn. So they woke up before the flush of dawn, right before the time of Fajr, and I gave them milk, and then I fed my children and my wife. He said, Oh Allah, if you know that I did this, seeking only your pleasure, then please relieve us of our hardship. Please relieve us of this hardship. So the rock blocking the cave shifted a little. The dua was answered. Dua accepted. And then the second man made dua, Oh Allah, I used to have a cousin that I loved more passionately than any man could love a woman more passionately than any man could love any woman. He says, I tried to seduce her multiple times, but she refused. She was a good person. One time she came to me in a season of great hardship and famine. She came to me and she asked for help. So he said, I offered her. She agreed because of desperation. And when some laborers, and I paid them their wages. One of them left behind his wages and he forgot to take it, he left. I took the amount of money that he forgot behind the wages I was going to pay him, and I invested it in a business. And my business prospered greatly. After a while, the man came back and said, I need my wages. I need my wages, O servant of Allah. So I told him, everything that you see here is yours. The cattle and these camels and the goats and everything you see in front of you, it's yours to take. So the man said, O servant of Allah, do not joke with me. Because he remembers his wages were very little. But this man invested it. He made so much money off of it that he said, all of this is yours. It is your right. So that man took everything and he spared nothing. He left nothing behind. Nothing behind for the owner. So the man says, oh Allah, if you know that I did this seeking only your pleasure, Ya Allah, please relieve us of our hardship. Please relieve us of this hardship that we find ourselves in. 
and the dua was accepted immediately and the rock shifted further and now there was enough room for the three men to escape from the cave. Now there's three beautiful lessons from this hadith. The first is that we learn that one of the things that we can do, one of the permissible forms of tawassu, is when you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by means of your good deed, asking Allah through that good deed that you've done in the past. This is permissible. The second is that every time one of these three men made dua, they made dua and they added a condition. What is the shart? What is the condition? They said, oh Allah, if you know that we did this purely for your sake, so it has to be sincere for your sake, then relieve us of our hardship, then accept the dua. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges and knows whether it was performed sincerely or not. Because if it was not performed sincerely, the dua would have been rejected. But it was performed sincerely, so the dua was accepted. So Allah accepted every one of their dua because everything they mentioned was sincerely for His sake. And the things that we want to look at, the first two are of very important things, obeying and respecting one's parents, and we will talk about this in depth inshallah. There's so much blessings in it, honoring your parents taking care of your parents, loving your parents, and leaving a sin at the very last moment. Look at the man who almost committed intercourse. He left in the last moments, in the very last moments. And because he left the sin at the very last moment, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow him to be under the shade of Allah on the day of resurrection. We mentioned when we spoke about the day of judgment that one of the types of people who will be shaded on that day is the one who leaves intercourse from a very beautiful woman for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this man left for the sake of Allah. She said, fear Allah, ittaqillah. And he left only for the sake of Allah. And the proof of that is that the dua was accepted. Because he said, by Allah, if you know, oh Allah, if you know that I did this purely for your sake. So the dua was accepted. So this reminds us that if you're about to commit a sin, my dear brothers and sisters, you can still leave that sin at the very last moment before you commit it. You can still leave. It's never too late. And if you've fallen into the sin, then you better repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when you commit that sin, there's a big difference between what you will feel afterwards and what you will feel if you had left that sin for the sake of Allah. And the third and the one we want to focus on is the man who had the wages, the laborer, who forgot his money. And he used that wealth, that money, to invest in a business. Now imagine, imagine my brothers and sisters, that this man, when the guy came back to him, he could have said, here's your... Let's say 10 dinars. Take your 10 dinars. And the man would have taken the 10 dinars and left because that's what he remembered. But he took that amount of money, however much it was, and he invested it. So that means that amount of money and everything that he invested through it belongs to the other man. He, he was honest. He could have hid it and said, you only, I only owed you this amount. But he was honest and he said, all of this belongs to you. This is your right. That man was amazed. All of this? Is this a joke? So because he gave him everything that belonged to him, he left his wealth, his right with that man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted his dua. So when you consume the wealth of other people, the rights of other people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish you in the dunya, you won't have barakah, and in the grave and on the day of resurrection. And you will lose your currency on the day of judgment. You don't want any reason to lose your hasanat on the day of judgment. You want to gain as much hasanat as possible. So my dear brothers and sisters, if you have infringed on the rights of other people, you have to return the rights to them. And if, for example, you've stolen something from someone and somebody will ask, I cannot find the person I stole it from. What should I do? You take the amount that you stole from them, you donate on their behalf. And if you can find the person, you return the right back to them. They don't have to know what you're giving them is something you stole, but you should return the right to them. If you stole in the rights of people in any way whatsoever, return the rights to them in the dunya because on the day of judgment, it will be much more severe much more severe. Now one of the beautiful things about this hadith is that when you look at this hadith and you look at how these three men made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they begged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah accepted their dua. You have to ask yourself, if you were in their position, what would you think of? What deed can you say to yourself that you can make as a form of dua? Oh Allah, I did this purely for your sake. Is there anything you can think of? Because if there isn't, then you should worry. If you're not doing anything sincerely for the sake of Allah, where you're absolutely sure, you're not confused, you're not doubting, you're sure you did it for the sake of Allah, then you have to try to find things you can do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the best way to do that is to do deeds in private. And we mentioned some of these things in a previous episode when we talked about sincerity. 
So find the private deeds, my dear brothers and sisters, something between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, to make us sincere at all times and to allow us to do these sincere deeds. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the punishment of the hellfire. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to resurrect us with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and allow us to enter paradise bi ghayri hisab. This concludes our episode for today. We will see you next time, inshallah ta'ala, as we continue discussing the topic of the hellfire and we start to conclude the topics of the hellfire. Fire. Jazakumullahu khaira wa salli lahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Scale of justice will be brought before man. Now you shall have to explain your whole life span. What you did in the open and what you Small shall today be revealed. Your deeds shall then be weighed in a scale. This shall determine if you pass or fail.